Today on Gritty Bowman, we hang out with friend Donnie Vincent. I could sit and listen to Donnie tell stories for hours. He's an explorer, biologist, conservationist, and sportsman. When Donnie's storytelling transcends the spoken word and comes to life in the form of cinematic film, it's incredible. His films change hearts and minds, and films like Who We Are, The Rivers Divide, and Terra Nova have permanently changed how I view the world and the hunt. So sit back and enjoy the show. And then, if you haven't already, support Donnie by getting his films at www.donnyvincent.com. Those who know me know that I love a good hunting story. And I'm no Donnie Vincent, but Gritty Bowman has its own brand of filmmaking. It's kind of gritty. It's a bit unpolished. It usually has a few smart aleck comments, some shaky footage, some adventure, and it reminds you of the hunts you go on with your own buddies. So with that preamble, I have an announcement to make. On Thursday, February 8th at the Western Hunt Expo in Salt Lake City, I'll be showing my latest gritty film on the big screen. And it's not just my film that'll be showing. My good friend Cole Kramer will also be featuring his Yeti film from Nepal. There's going to be gritty bingo, prizes, raffles, giveaways, and much more. My good friends at Sitka Gear, Yeti, Hoyt, Mountain Ops, and Leupold Optics are helping to make this event awesome. And as this film is about mountain goats, it's fitting that all raffle proceeds go to the Rocky Mountain Goat Alliance. If you want to support Gritty and you're coming to the Western Hunt Expo, please go to www.mountainops.com forward slash gritty and get tickets now. Invite your friends and your family and come see what a gritty movie night is all about. Please indulge me by listening to this 30 second trailer for the film. There is a difference between being in nature and not hunting and being in nature and hunting. It's difficult to explain. All the senses are driven to their limits. Wind direction means more. The scent in the air means more. Seeing imprints in the ground means more. Daylight means more. And life means more. Yeah, I killed my first elk. Went on my first elk hunt. That's right. That was yeah. cool. When you're in college, you're going to gravitate towards a girl's <laughs> dorm over a birthday right. cake. But when you're 60, you're like, whose cake is that? <laughs> you start if to I shift. sing happy birthday, do I get a piece of that cake? <laughs> and he's just sitting there, and then he's just like, and just bugles. I mean, 17 yards yeah. right there. I just pulled through my shot and turned around. He's like, what happened? I'm like, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? I'm like, I don't know. He's 17 yards away. Like, when I shot, the air was gone. I'm like, <laughs> all right. So, what, what's going on with you? Like, you got something coming up soon? Like, I'm dying for a film. And everyone is. Well, I mean, I shouldn't say everyone is, but I get a lot of hate mail. <laughs> a few I people. A, yeah. 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 People want to see it, don't they? Yeah. And it's. Uh, which. Uh, which uh, do you feel pressure? No. Because, I mean, you freaking delivered. Thank so, you. So. I, I don't feel pressure because if, if somebody was paying for it yeah. other than me, I'd feel pressure, mm. but I don't feel pressure. I work with a couple of companies, um, you know, on a, on a business type level, but we do it, call it gray area if you want. Yeah. Uh, we do it in a manner that, you know, I, I just don't, I don't like the idea of being sponsored. I yeah. don't like the idea of. If it's a partnership and it's a business partnership and as a business, you, you two businesses have to operate, but it's mm-hmm. not like. The expectations and, and the sponsorship and all these things, thats a, I think it's a whole different world that you try to remove yourself well, from as much be, as possible. To be honest, when I see a Donnie Vincent film, I don't want to see <laughs> sponsored by anywhere in it. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Like there's yeah. a certain image that can feel that comes with your stuff and there's a certain I'll, I'll give you integrity a good... that it, it has. This is the only question I have for you, Donnie, before we get really into it. Are you sponsored by beanies? No. <laughs> Dude, no. you wear the most epic beanies. <laughs> I do have fun shopping and, for them. And he, ha- he has like, he, and Donnie has like, uh, Donnie has like. Uh, Dude, the one in Rivers the, Divide is classic. Yes, the Rivers Divide uh, beanie. What brand you, was it? It was a skater it's, it's brand. A, it's Anon. It's Burton. It's Burton. Burton. It's That's Burton's what it is. Sister company, Anon. 
Uh, yeah. I was just curious because I see we got Cole today, but I didn't yeah. know if there's a sponsor for the nope, Beanie Life. No, nope. this is um, so I got my first one. Uh, it's a s- stupid little story, but I was walking through a ski chalet and there's a really pretty girl working the counter. And uh, oh, just yeah. as I was walking by, she literally took that Anon cap off of my <laughs> off of the rack and she tossed it at me and I caught it and she just said, "Put this on really quick," and I put it on really quick and she's like, "Oh, you look." Super handsome, and I fell for it. <laughs> wow. And so uh, she sold a hat that day, and I walked out with a smile, which, you know, you give people when you say, hey, you look super handsome look or good. really yeah. pretty. You give somebody a smile, which yeah. is great. But yeah. I walked out with that beanie, and then uh, all of a sudden, um, you know, I would just do my thing. I would do my hunts. I would do uh-huh. photographs, whatever. And I'd come here as ATA, or I'd meet yeah. friends around, and, and all of a sudden people started stopping me and saying, hey, are, are you are you Donnie Vincent? You know, and I'd say, holy uh, I am, but how do you know that? You know, and so, but they would just hear through the grapevine. Like I would go up to the Arctic by myself and shoot a big caribou, and then I'd send a couple of buddies the photo, and then it would just get out there, and then mm-hmm. guys would. And so all of a sudden, somebody stopped me here one time, and they said, "Yeah, hey, are you the guy with the hat? Yeah, the beanie." You know, and I said, "Yeah, yeah, I got it right here." And it, it's literally it has nothing <laughs> to do with image; it has everything to do with getting my hair out of my face. That's yeah, the, that's the brilliant mystery solved. Yep. I was always, you know, it's always, it's fascinating. Everybody kind of has their look and their thing yeah. and people mm-hmm. develop that based on, you know, a girl throwing you, a, a pretty yeah. girl throwing you a, yeah. a hat and, and saying so you I, look good. So. I've always worn them and, and, uh, and the funny thing is I went out and once, and it was, it's tough to find the fit for me. Yeah. I have mm-hmm. a huge head and it's weirdly shaped. And so <laughs> I went and found. Brian's just quite the opposite. So I've got, yeah. got a tiny head, dude. I found where, um, somebody was selling them on, um, like a leftover, uh-huh. and I bought like three or four of them, and I rolled through them because I always I have this little tick. You'll see it on film if you pay close enough attention. But and I do it in life. I touch my forehead and I go like this. Okay, and I'll wear a hole through my hat in about eight. <laughs> eight <laughs> oh, oh. In about eighteen because months, you go through that process. I'll wear a that. hole. Yeah, no, you'll, you do. You'll see, like, you do. If, if you go look, if you go Terra look, Nova. like half of my hats have a hole right there. Uh-huh. And so then last July we were in Australia, and I had it in the seat back pocket of the airplane that we we're coming home from australia and i just forgot it in there <laughs> and so then i was and they don't make them anymore yeah and um and that was so, a bummer huh yeah you know i was you just like oh man that's impossible and so uh but yeah i just i like i like hats and and uh cole is actually a really freaking you know they don't they don't know that i exist but they're a really freaking cool company and they okay. really designed like they went after headwear i was just reading their mission statement they went after headwear and just said look like we're gonna make headwear legit really? real good headwear and i've noticed like a couple of our posts mm-hmm. um recently they've um followed them or whatever and whatever you i hate yeah, social yeah, media yeah. but so but it's cool that they're a s- snowboarding uh skate company uh, that urban company over a little and, bit. yeah but they're uh-huh. just like it's not that they're crossing over it's just like yeah you do cool shit stuff you do cool <laughs> stuff so um so like we're, like, you're admirable. just doing cool stuff. So like yeah. no judgment, no fear of, of support, but just, and it was, it was simple, like, or a simple follow, whatever it was, but, um, there, it was just cool. So I'll, I'll definitely be wearing these guys a little so, bit more. And so Donnie, do you come from a, uh, snowboarding skate background? No, I, um, the only thing I did in any sort of extreme sports, I raced motorcycles for several years. Okay. Uh, when I was a kid, just, that was my sport that I did. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I just gravitated towards motocross mm-hmm. and i love the fitness of it and i love going fast and i love the dirt and just it's fun you know when you're a kid you know yeah. you're just like yeah this is wicked That's so awesome. i worked a couple of jobs bought a dirt bike and took to the farm fields and so angered my neighbors what <laughs> angered my neighbors where did you grow up where where did you where's home connecticut connecticut yeah, is I, okay up until i was 15 then I which moved part there. of connecticut uh about an hour north of hartford Hartford, because yep. I lived in Danbury, Connecticut, for sure. a while, and Stanford, um, uh, for for about six or seven months. But um, yeah, Connecticut's a, a great place. Yeah, yeah it's fun. The it's rich fun. history there is pretty fascinating. Too. I did not even really realize cool. it. Just the, I mean, obviously being one of the much earlier states that were established in the United yeah. States. But I was sitting there living in a place that I had no idea was rich with history all around me, like historical monuments and sites and things mm-hmm. that happened not only during the war but just during establishment of the United States. Yeah. It's, Pretty cool place, but I, I did not know where where you hailed from or yep. where you, you grew and I live up. in Wisconsin now. Wisconsin, yeah. home now. Cool. Yeah, and yeah. So what are you what what have you been up to? Like what happened this year? Anything? Any some like stand out? 
Well, uh, like, adventures for you? Um, yeah, I killed my first elk. Went on my first elk hunt. That's right. That was yeah. cool. Was that Nevada that you It went? was in Nevada. Okay. Yep. And it was, uh, I know everyone is so fixated on elk in the world. Oh, yeah. A little I mean, bit. revolves around elk, and I'd never hunted elk, and I never really wanted to hunt elk uh-huh. because they just didn't. Yeah. Just didn't do it for me. Like, mm-hmm. I'd rather go caribou hunting than go elk hunting. Yeah. And everyone's, 99% of the people are the exact opposite. Yep. Um, and uh, going elk hunting was fascinating. It was, the elk mm-hmm. were amazing. Mm-hmm. Like, I definitely got bit by yeah. the bug, 100%. Um, the thing Is that it, I... Did, was it, did you expect, I mean, did it did it live up to expectations or did it let them down or was it... Well, exceed... Big time, let it down. Yeah. Uh, the animal itself exceeded. Yeah. Like seeing them usher their cows. Right. The bugles, of course. Just seeing them move, seeing their racks. Like the first day I hiked is really funny. Uh, and I'm not going to tell that story. But um, <laughs> uh, the, one of the guy, gentlemen that we were hunting with, uh, he slept in the truck while we, my, while me and my team, we were just want to go. Yeah. So like this dude we were hunting with, he slept in the truck while we climbed to the top of the mountain and just looked around. Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't want to climb to the top of the mountain because he was just like. That's lame. Yeah. So I went up there, and there was a big box canyon. While I was coming down at night, uh, in the afternoon, I, there were a couple of bugles in there. And those were my first wild bugles I had ever heard. And I was like, oh. I mean, I literally instantly was thrust into the, the books that I'd read as a kid. Yeah. I'd only read a couple of things about elk, but enough to where I was picturing these sharp, stark box canyon crumbly rock these conifers moving up and and just kind of this dry arid uh you know picturesque place and minus the snow at this time of year but just coming down i just heard like it's just like yeah whoa like i didn't see him i was just like whoa and i it was just pretty heavy and i was by myself Mm -hmm. like that's pretty heavy and so then he did it again it's like this is wicked. So that aspect of it, I loved. Yeah. When I hunted by myself or with my crew, I loved it. Um, the thing that I absolutely thought was disgusting, mm-hmm. and I, I mean, it sounds really harsh, but the people. Yeah. There were people like when when I went there, I had talked to several people that had hunted this area. They're like, "This can be the hardest hunt of your life, hardest hunt of your life." I said, "That's, that's well, big, I've been on a lot. That's, that's so pretty big I was words. Say, yeah. you're, that's those are some pretty, pretty big words. So. Big words." If you're going to lead it that way, I mean, I've done some things in my life, but I like a challenge. I mean, so. I, I've, I've had a couple of sheep hunts that I was going to say. Uh, were, like, I, I don't know that I could have walked another hour. Sure. And, and I ha- I've had one sheep hunt where I very, very nearly lost my life to hypothermia only through that egging on of my partner who I was hunting with. Only through him and I encouraging each other did we live. Both of us, I mean, absolutely 100% should have died. We yeah. made horrible, horrible mistakes. We tried to we tried to hike about seventeen miles through a blizzard wearing just street clothes, <laughs> and because we were we were gonna just get there, and uh, it was Mistake. horrific. So yeah, so right off the bat, I'm told this is gonna be the hardest hunt of my life. It wasn't even top fifty, I'd say maybe top as far as difficulty. Oh yeah, okay. yeah, it was it was really it was, people it was, told you that it just goes to show what people have pushed themselves through. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah right, was, like. To hear that it's the hardest of your life and you get there and you're like, yeah, really not. No, I mean, we, we, we park the truck and look up the mountain. And, yeah, it's at 12,000 feet, yeah. but he's standing right there. Like, I'm at the truck and I can already see my quarry. He's right there. And so I'm used to park the truck, hike five miles into the hunting area, hike another 10 miles in further into the hunting area to a good spot, set up camp, and then go hiking from there to go see if you can find a right. female of the species, right. <laughs> let alone a male, let alone an adult male, right. let alone an adult male that is late in age. Yeah, yeah. So um, 100%. The thing, that, the thing that just rotted my mind was the four-wheeler trails, the side-by-sides, the ATVs, the pickup trucks. And where I was, um, we hunted a place called um, Shell Creek, Shell Creek Mountains. Shell Creek. Mm-hmm. Yep. And um, um, there's only a few tags there. And so I was like, this is going to be awesome. Right. Just a couple of tags, a couple of dudes doing their thing. It's going to be quiet. We'll slip in there. That's what you'd think. It'll be beautiful to film. Well, what I didn't realize is that with each guy, 
he has 15 family and oh. friends trying to find the 400 inch bull that are all so, along the ridge lines. Yeah, scouting and, I, and, and I saw him and, so negative because I was doing kind of the same thing, except for I didn't have a team of people other than the people that I was filming, filming with. But it's like, it just gives me this perspective of everyone's out there looking for this giant. None of them, and I'm generalizing here, and I'm really going down a negative trail here, but it just kind of has to be said. But none of them seemingly are there for the experience. Everyone was there for the inches of antler. 100% everyone was there for the photo. And I even talked to a gentleman. He was very, very nice. His name was Ed. But we saw this pretty nice bull up on the hill. He's probably 350 class if you if you want to categorize it. Mm-hmm. And this dude rolled up to me, super nice guy. And he's like, you see that bull up there? And I said, yeah, I see that bull up there. And he's like, here's the deal. You want to kill that bull? I was like, well, I don't, I don't even know what I'm doing yet today. And he's like, why don't I run up there on my quad? And I freaking, you go over here to this saddle, and I'll literally just run him right to you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he he was just trying to help. He was just right. trying to help. He was being genuine. He was he, like, "This is this is how we do it. That's how, this that's how, how we roll. That's how it works." Yeah. yeah. So, if, so if you want me to help you out, I'm happy to do it. It, it was the it, it just was the exact. And so I started as soon as I came home. I now have been bitten by the elk bug. Mm-hmm. So as soon as I came home, and I haven't done my homework nearly enough, right. but as soon as I came home, I started looking into: Does anyone do wilderness elk hunts? And I don't know the answer yet. I know there's a lot of people that say they do. I know there's a lot of people that take horses into some place, and I know there's a lot of um, stuff like that. But um, you know, I, 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 if there's a true backcountry wilderness elk hunt um, where we can either backpack in or take horses in and then backpack from there or whatever, but the elk were sensational. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the country was beautiful. The ATV trails, um, and I even read on a billboard when we were pulling in there, they had a billboard that said S- there was so much intrusion from hunters and off-roaders that the elk population was starting to suffer in the region because literally they were dying of starvation because hunters were harassing them Especially so significantly during the winter in the winter zone that it was pushing them out to habitat they could not survive on. And so literally the... Nevada Department of Wildlife mm-hmm. had to come in. Is it the Nevada Department of Wildlife or th- it's a fishing game? It's going to be like, yeah, Nevada's DWR or something yeah. like that. Yep. So they, they actually came in and there was like 375 miles of cut roads that like ATVs are just like, yeah, I can drive up there. And so they do. And so they had to come in and literally close like 180 miles of road so that the elk could return to the area because there's so much harassment from, and, and call a spade a spade. The harassment was from hunters, P- yes. plain and simple. I mean, there were some off-roaders, there were some campers and stuff, but 100% harassment was from hunters. Right. And Especially how shed season has become such a popular thing. I was thing. just thinking that. You know, it's like, um, <clears throat> it's just, the, now there's shed season hunting or shed season dates. There's there's a, know, there's I mean, a season there seasons for it. In yeah. fact, this year, uh, uh, no, excuse me, last do, do you year. See I know what you're saying. Do you see what you're saying? I know. No, we, I know. we don't regulate elk anymore. We regulate their antlers. We regulate people. Yeah, we regulate people. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's interesting because this last Crazy. year in Utah, uh, because of um, we had some significant snow this year, not so much. I don't know how it's going to go, but they actually closed down what they called uh, antler gathering or shed hunting. You're kidding so, me. There's so, a thing? There's a thing. So they shut that down in Utah. <laughs> if I ever find a shed antler, you can have it. <laughs> Dude, bro. I don't care if it's a world record. You can have it. You I don't, both if, have it. You can share if it. I, if I, uh, I could probably trip over an antler and probably wouldn't even be able to find one. Like I'm not, I'm not as skilled as a lot of the shed hunters. And I know that there's some passions there that they have for that, you know, to, to, to gather those up and find the matches and stuff. Uh, but it was interesting because, yeah, the, the, it came down to, they said, to what it sounds like Nevada was doing, which was in Utah, they wanted to shut it down because the amount of snow, the herds, they were they were worried about pressuring the animals and putting them Especially in these habitats bulls are like and as areas. skinny as they can get. They push themselves so hard through the rut. And now oh. they now at the most vulnerable now they can't time. Eat. Yeah, they, yeah. You, you're 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 kind of intruding in, and there's there's an intrusion of yeah they're delicate and they're they're sitting here in their environment and we're coming in and we're pressuring them and we're we're forcing them to say well, I got to get out of here but this is where my food was or this is where I was going to winter mm-hmm. and you're pushing out and so I, I understand the argument that some may say and there was a big argument in Utah about well. <laughs> You're saying that hunters can't go gather horns, but you'll let people ride their snowmobiles or do these things. And I'm like, I understand. I agree that if you're gonna if you're gonna take care of the animal, all 
all people That's in right. all spaces need to be restricted from these areas. It seemed like the hunters were kind of getting a little kick, but to your, to your point, you know, those access points that you're sitting there and you're saying, guys, where can I go that I can have a true, hardcore remote experience that's liberating like i'm used to in my caribou hunts or on my sheep hunts mm, that wow. i can go somewhere and there's there are places that you can do that you can hunt elk that are going to have but limited if, access but and I'll tell it's you hard this, i i had the experience that i wanted to the day i killed when you when when it all came together unbelievable i ended up hunting with this guy um i i hired an outfitter because i just wanted to have some help of some i didn't have the time yeah, i was going to say to come in and do the homework and no. understand everything, where they're at and what they're doing. No, I prefer that, but that's just not was not a reality in my life. Yep. Um, I love that. F- even failing at that is really fun, yes. especially if you can do it year after year. Because if you're like, ooh, mm-hmm. I can put a journal together. Now, this I, this is what a, I learned last year. This yeah. is a draw tag? Yes. So Yes. Okay. And, and so, so um, but... The day it happened, this guy that, that I met through a, through the uh, outfitter, it's actually one of his head guides, but he said, hey, I know a spot. It's difficult to get to. Uh, it's physical to get to. Yeah. The road that accesses this area, they closed it off way far away so that uh, it shuts a lot of guys down because they literally have to walk like an extra five miles to access this area. Yeah. He's like, let's go in there. And it was cool because it was overcast, rainy. The clouds were really low, slipping through the hills, you know, and we, we went over this spot and and um, I had not done any calling, so he, this guy started calling, and, and the bugles fired up, and then this big, I mean, this thing looked, it, literally when it walked out, I looked at, the guy's name is Adam, I looked at Adam, and he goes, that thing's Jurassic, dude. That thing is <laughs> Jurassic. And he had, like, he just had super long thirds, and he was on, we were on this really steep ravine, and he's just sitting on the other side of us just, you know, he's just mm-hmm. bugling. And he's just looking around. He thrashed something. He eats something. He's a clearly an old, old, old man. Yeah. He acted like an old man, right? Like he was sex crazed. <laughs> he definitely best. wanted to get to the cow, but there's <sighs> pretty good patch of grass right there. <laughs> you know, and if you, you know, if you, you know, if you, if you, it's when they've <laughs> turned the dentures, corner, they're on yeah, the edge. Yeah. Yeah. When you're in college, you're going to gravitate towards a girl's <laughs> dorm over a birthday right. cake. But when you're 60, you're like, whose cake is that? <laughs> And right, you start if to I shift. sing happy birthday, do I get a piece of that cake? <laughs> and so that's what this guy was like. I really want to see this girl, but she's all the way at the top of that thing. And there's birthday cake right yeah. there. So I'm going to eat a little bit. So we cut to the head of the canyon and started sneaking down through this mahogany little thicket. And it was really cool because all of a sudden Adam was right in front of me. And he's like, he goes, hey, I see him. And I looked up to say like, hey, I hear him say, hey, I see him. And I look up and the bull is at. 17 yards walking <laughs> we're walking down the same trail mm-hmm. and so everyone just stops there's four of us everyone just stops and, and basically lays down and we're just all sitting there laying down and he's just and but i'm i'm looking out my left eye and my right eye but mostly my <laughs> left eye and i'm just sitting there i have my i use a carter honey a lot of the yeah, times a, yeah. a hinge so i'd like to get some pressure on that just so i know everything's all lined mm-hmm. up i'm just sitting there you know on my knees and and he's looking at us, and I, I know the guys, like the gentlemen that work with me, they're so freakishly talented. Like, they are so talented that they knew they were going to get pinned down. So when they dropped, they dropped, like, anchoring their elbows in the camera. Getting ready to like, set up for yep, the sh- for yep, shot. They just anchored and, like, sitting there. And I'm sitting there, and, and uh, the bull, is, he's drooling Snot and snots nose. coming out of his nose. And he's looking at us. And I'm wearing a bright red, fire engine red <laughs> stocking cap, right? And a tan raincoat, and he's, he's just, such a rebel. I know. <laughs> he's on that solid nation. He's just burning a hole in me, and he's just sitting there, and then he's just like, and just bugles. I mean, 17 yards yeah. right, there. and it's a quiet day, so it just rips right through you. And then it's kind of cool because his, and I'm looking at the whole time I'm sitting there, I'm just watching his biology. I'm yeah. watching his ears, and I know I have the wind for about 10 feet. He has to walk to get it. So he's just sitting there looking at us. So I'm looking at his eyeballs. I'm looking at his pupils, his ears. I'm looking at his antlers. I'm just watching him process everything. And this is where I kind of start to lose myself a little bit because I start to get so involved with the animal that I start to almost convince myself that I don't want to go through killing him. Yeah. Right? Because I'm like, I'm the executioner today. I know this. I know this is a big decision. I know everything here is going to come to a pinnacle here soon. I'm going to have to make a decision. So... If he walks to his left, 
I'm either going to have to shoot over the guide's head, which I'm completely comfortable, <laughs> in, in all honesty, I'm completely comfortable doing, but would never do on video because I would get so much yeah. ridicule from people that right. would question it. Would, yeah, would, would, would probably make a better decision because you probably shouldn't do that. But in the reality is, I would feel pretty comfortable doing it. But you should you should never do that. And if the guide, it's another thing too. Is if uh, if the guide, if if I'm in front of a friend, I'm like shoot. Oh, I we, we discussed choice. it afterwards, and he said I would have been furious. Yeah. If you didn't shoot. And, and so I said, well, I couldn't have. I just couldn't have because it's not a, a million people are going to see this and it's not the right way for a million people to watch. This is not yeah. safe. You should not shoot near people. And so luckily, and we knew this, he wanted to get the wind. Mm-hmm. So he turned and it was just so cool because as he took a quiet step, I just rose up and came to my knees and just found my anchor point. And then just settled. I literally shot through a little basketball or a little, like, grapefruit little size triangle. And he just stopped perfectly with his vitals right in there. And I just pulled through my shot. And and um, it was the single most embarrassing tracking job I've ever had in my entire life. Why? We, first of all, the, the guy that I was hunting with, Adam, the guide, turned around. He's like, what happened? I'm like, Phew. your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? I'm like, I don't know. He's 17 yards away. Like, when I shot, the air was gone. I'm like, <laughs> right. Everything, everything felt yeah, like so it's great. supposed to. Uh-huh. But he's like, your guess is really as good as mine. I you for yeah. sure. Were it's, you looking too? <laughs> did you see what, what I saw? Did, did, yeah. Does anybody know what's it, happening right now? And so I literally look back at the photographers. I had a gentleman with yeah. me who's been with me every step. His name's William Altman. You guys have heard that name where he's been. He's literally taken every step I've taken in this career. And then we had a freelance guy named Pete. And Pete's this kind of super weird quiet <laughs> man <laughs> and he's just like i think i saw what happened and i think your arrow is a little bit high but nearly perfect <laughs> a little bit high but nearly, <laughs> nearly perfect, perfect. And i said <laughs> okay and um and uh oh so we went back gosh. and we kind of started looking at footage we tried to like yeah. try to like and so we all of a sudden we we got to the footage where we could look and we saw where my red fletching was high but like high scapular or whatever. So mm-hmm. uh, so we go we go out to where he retreated, and we can see his tracks, no arrow, no blood. So we just sit there, and, and, and Adam, the guide, had just told us a story the day before that he had shot a big bull the year before, and he heart-punched him, and the thing went like 300 yards okay. and almost yeah. no blood. Yeah. And he's like, it took me like two days to find him, but I found him, and it was an absolute 12-ring shot. And that it's just they're big, strong animals. They, they have are. a lot of oxygen in their blood. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They'll. I mean, after they get going, and I've had the same thing happen to me. Once they get going, like it, it clogs adrenaline. Up. Yeah. Everything yeah. that's pumping, it's like it can, it can stop. I no longer yeah. expect. You know, you can have a perfect shot and no blood. It, yeah. It just things happen. Oh, yeah, I don't that, know how or why. Perfect shot, no blood, yep. and you can have a perfect shot, and it and it just doesn't make sense because you can see them fall over in fifteen seconds sometimes. Not really with an elk so much, but 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 you can see him run two, three hundred yards mm-hmm. easy. Th- this guy fell over in like four seconds. Did he? Yeah. So, dude. So, um, <laughs> so we go out there, and he's like, Adam's like, well, he's probably there's a big ravine next to us. He's like, he's more than likely in there, either stone dead or not. Mm-hmm. Meaning, like, mm-hmm. he's either stone dead or we're likely not going. He's going to live. Yeah. Depending on he's what happens. He's either there or not. Yeah. Yeah. And so we start following his tracks. We're following his tracks. There's four of us. Two guys are looking through the lens of their camera. So they are expunged from this yeah. failure. So Adam and I are we're <laughs> tracking. We're positive he's in this ravine. And so we're tracking. And all of a sudden I look down on this little flat rock. We went about 50 yards. And I go, oh, hey, there's about a quarter size drop of blood. So, okay, we know. I hit him. We're on the and, path. We, and we knew I hit him, but you know, we're like, it's okay, like, for real. It's for real. Blood. Yeah. This isn't our blood. So we hit him. <laughs> <laughs> and so and there's like three drops of blood. And then I see Adam kind of look up and he goes, Oh hey. And I look down like ten feet and there's my arrow. He's like, Oh, here's your arrow. And he picks it up and it's clean. Totally, totally clean. Yeah. Um but and totally intact. And I was like, Oh, okay. And he's like, Okay, so okay, so we're processing this information, and all, all of a sudden, our, our director of photography, William Allman, goes, Donnie. And I look over, and he's like, points. And literally, like, 
<laughs> ten, ten, ten feet behind Adam in the wide open, <laughs> wide you guys, open. You guys are looking right here. Is, We've got a quarter size blood is, here. Uh, okay, however what's the much next an leaf? elk weighs, twelve hundred pounds or whatever, a thousand pounds is laying dead in the wide open. <laughs> and I literally, I see it. And the only thing we couldn't see was his antlers because they fell behind yeah. a little tree. But we could see his entire body. <laughs> and I literally looked at it, and my very first thought was, oh, there's another dead elk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no way. You didn't even think oh, it was just your like own. That, that, that can't why? be mine. But I, <laughs> yeah. There's no way that can be mine. Yeah. Why I wonder that, who else is in here. Why is that elk there? <laughs> you know, and that's literally my initial thought. And then I looked it back at it. It, it was so stupid. <laughs> and you'll see it in the film. And I have no problem saying this because we do some things. We have to reenact some things uh-huh. just to film them better. But I have no, like, the, everything in the video is completely fake. Because that's how we found it. And <laughs> that's it was so, we all bust it. out laughing, kind of, not laughing, but we all, yeah. we're, 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 we're very relief. embarrassed that we're all supposed to be. At these, least mediocre at our at yeah, our. You guys are these craft. experienced hunters, trackers. Like it's, we've got a blood trail. And this isn't uh, a leopard. All you had to do like, this was thing look is bright up. yellow. <laughs> this thing is so yeah. So it was the day that it happened. That was for you. Yeah. So I was there. Pinnacle. For, I was there for twenty one days, and about four hours of twenty one days fit my mind's eye of what I wanted. That's awesome. So it was the right four hours. It will be. Uh, beautiful film. I definitely got bit by the bug. I definitely want to hunt elk more. I definitely want to hunt elk more where people aren't. Yeah. yeah. And I don't care what that means. And it, and it wasn't. Um, a lot of guys are going to hate me for saying this, but um, it just wasn't that hard to carry out. And I hear a lot of guys saying, like, mm. they will break you down. And I've seen videos of guys that are really, really beat up at the end of a backpack, but it just wasn't that hard. Uh, um, I've uh, carried moose out. And yeah. so every, I measure everything off of that. And so... And that's a lot to measure off of. Well, here's a the moose. thing. Like, it is. Like, yeah. I, I really think... Um, dude, I mean, don't it, get me wrong. It was heavy. It was heavy. And it yeah. took us several trips, but it was... Extru- like, backpacks are only rated for so much weight. Yeah. An elk kind of fits within that rating. A yeah. moose does not. A moose starts to cut you oh, in half. Dude, a moose is start- ridiculous. Yeah. So, I shot my first moose this year. Aaron and oh, I cool. each, each killed a moose. And, um, you know... The side, I, I have a photo of, of a, of a white tail's hindquarter and a moose in the garage. I mean, it's not even, oh, yeah. it's, it looks like I'm holding like a little rabbit mm-hmm. in one, and then this moose is just so big. Yeah. Uh, so, and an elk is, is, it's not a moose. But I think when you, it's so relative to people. So we hiked, um, we were helping my buddy and his kids hunt, and I've hiked so much. I'm like, there's there's elk way up on this mountain, and it's a youth tag, Colorado. It's way up there, and I'm like, let's just go over there. And they're like, well, that's a long way, and you got to go down this canyon, you got to go up. And I'm like, and I'm from my perspective, I'm like, the elk are over there, let's just go over there. Yeah, that's where the experience is. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, we could sit here all day and look all, but there's the elk. What yeah. are we waiting for? Yeah. And they're like, but it's straight down and straight up, and it's miles. And I'm like, yeah. So, so, and so we ended up going up there and the boys, uh, we chased the elk and we came back and w- when we got back, it was 17 miles for the day. Okay. And it was, but it was straight down. Which and is straight a lot. Up. That's a lot. It is yeah. a lot. Yeah. But for me, it was like, that's okay. It didn't bother me at oh, all. Yeah. But yeah. the boys, I felt bad. I, I how, how old I, are they? They're, uh, like, uh, 14, 15. That's a lot 14. of steps. That's a lot of steps for those guys. And they were like, and one of the youngest was, uh, I think, thirteen, and and so, but you know, they they're young, so they're resilient. Mm-hmm. But I I remember I did the hunt, and I'm thinking for me it was nothing. I could do it the next day, and the next day, and the next day. I've been doing it for four, three, four months. I was mm-hmm. out in the field a lot, and that's the that's what I really enjoy is, and I don't even thinking about how much walking it is. And what I don't realize until I'm with someone who doesn't do that, they're like, I'm down for two, three days now. Mm-hmm. Like, and the idea of going and repeating that is just, I never want to do that again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, like, you know, Donnie, you say, oh, I'm not going to offend anybody or anything like that. And I think it doesn't take anything away from, I don't think, I don't, I don't get offended at what you're saying. It doesn't take anything away from your experience. I love the pack. I love the yeah, camaraderie yeah. Of, of, of putting that meat in the pack, weighing it down, cinching it in, and just getting out of there. And, and that's what I mean, like, with an elk. When you load your pack, the pack functions, you mm-hmm. load it, it's heavy, Yeah, you have a long day ahead of you, but it's just taking another step. Yeah. No, I it was using the, um, so, 
a fulcrum. Yeah, Kafaru. Oh, fulcrum. that the, the the full. I think it was the full. Yeah, yeah, thing was fulcrum. Stupid it's got the wheels. Cool. Um, yeah, it was yeah. just like I could just load that thing up. That's what I mean. That though, thing can yeah. carry. That thing can carry. I <laughs> call it a can, meat that gobbler. That thing usually can carry more than the than the guy can carry. Oh yeah, you have a a, a, a fan base of people who who appreciate what you do, and they're watching what you do, and it's just like anything, you know. As I Western hunt, there's a lot of Eastern guys that. They would love to see me experience their world. Mm-hmm. Like, come and experience it. And I know there's a ton of elk hunters that are like, man, if Donnie only elk hunted, mm-hmm. he'd never want to do. He just that's all he'd want to do up forever. Oh you know? yeah, no way. That's that's yeah. the, but that's their that's the mentality because <laughs> oh, yeah. that's their first love. Yeah. And they're like, if you just ha- tasted it, then yeah. you would love it too. And, uh, and 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 I do, I do, I do, and I do get it. And it is, it's wicked. It is, and I'm I'm. At the same time, though, again. the same flip side is true, though. You know, being on a lot of these Arctic adventures that you've done and the moose and, and things like that, it's like these guys that have never done anything but elk hunt. There's a whole world out there of other adventures. <laughs> so, you know, you're in a draw unit. I imagine that it's a it's a pretty good unit if they only issued yes like four tags. Uh, no, no, it was I don't know how many, but it was like it was like twenty. It was like twenty, 20 tags, tags for the big. So area, it's like yeah. uh, so you're you're in a, a really nice unit. Here's what I what I've seen, you know, having hunted Arizona and some other places where you draw a a, a prime tag yeah. like that, right? You wait a long time. You put in the you go through the process. You're lucky. You you draw. It it sort of has a a natural selection process, right? Where you're gonna tend to get the people who put in for that hunt are about the size of the animal, just because of the more often than not they're kind of into in, inches, uh, almost more than the experience, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And and so then you go and you put yourself up, you insert yourself into that setting surrounded by guys that are you know like i'm not going to shoot that one that one's only 350 there's a uh there's a 395 over here so oh, th- th- there were a couple of guys that saw my bull sorry to interrupt you there were yeah. a couple of guys that saw my bull after i killed it and i could see that they felt bad for me <laughs> right it, that's <laughs> exactly what his, i mean his molars were almost worn smooth <laughs> mm-hmm. and I, I, they were like, oh, oh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good old bull. Nice job, that's Donnie. Good, that is that's really good, great. <laughs> so neat. You that's, got, that's what I mean. <laughs> I think there's, and I, but I got to say, like, especially from my, my audience, I feel like there's a whole world of hunters out there that are just transitioning away from inches being the obsession. There's mm-hmm. still that culture out there and there's still a group. And I think it, it, it clouds the, the experience of the hunt, in my opinion. When it's when you're when you're vacillating between taking a bull that's three seventy versus three ninety, it's like none of that stuff. Who cares? They're both beautiful. It's just like you did with like Steve and Rivers Divide. You can certainly get obsessed with a certain animal because you're just in love with it, and you're like, it's a unique animal, like a five by five in the three seventy yeah, range. Yeah, it's like wow, that's just doesn't come around every day. Much to the outfitter's chagrin, I didn't shower for 21 days. <laughs> and I, d- I did part of that because, like, um, I don't believe in scent control at all. Yeah. Zero, absolutely none. I do. Um, I think Ozonics and that type of arena is really cool stuff for, like, guys that True, ground blind right. run. When you can control the, yeah, the environment. The, the environment. But I think scent control is, like, an awesome money-making scheme. Oh, yeah. All you got to do. Brilliant money-making scheme. Play I mean, your wind, right? Know where your wind is and work with it. I mean, instead oh, of yeah. trying to say, like, out, dude, it was 90 you degrees. Invisible. You can't 90 degrees. Control. Every day, yeah, I yeah, don't think you can. The whole crew smell like a goat. <laughs> there's, there's no doubt when we see a big animal, you can appreciate yeah, what he is. The, yeah, or... yeah. There's no doubt, and but there takes nothing away from the experience of of an animal that's older or. or well, that's that's really you know what I mean. The gr- the the base of it is, in my opinion, is that back in the day, um, and I'm not talking about hunters and gatherers, and I'm not even talking about like. Um, like the settlers and the, and the some of the original type groups of hunters, but once hunting started taking on the form of guys doing it for recreation or, or just people yeah. like no, realizing they're hunters and going out hunting, the cool thing was is when you put yourself in the wilderness or in the duck blind or in the you know in a in a hide in a fallen down oak tree for a big white tail when you when you did these things and you went about your story, you went about your day, you went about your hunt. 
And then something fantastic happened. Instead of, instead of a regular, quote-unquote, regular eight-pointer walking out that you take, for some reason on this very day, an animal of exceptional magnitudes walks out. Like, let, let, let me pick on the world record whitetail uh, archery. Mel Johnson shot in October 29th, 19-whatever, 64, I think it was. Still the standing world record. Shot it wearing a plaid shirt, khakis, long bow or recurve bow on his knees in Illinois. I don't know if he knew that deer existed or if he was just sitting underneath that tree that day to go deer hunting and that deer walked out. But that's my point. Um, so often today, because of the technology we have and the communication that we have, we celebrate this end result only. I don't care how you got there. I don't care if you went to a high fence. Yeah. I don't care if you purchased a million dollar tag. I don't care if you flew there in your private jet. Just tell me how big was the sheep that you killed in Montana? Was it the world record? It was it over 200 inches? Because that, yeah. you're trying to equate that story when really what it used to be was we went hunting. We went fishing, and sometimes sensational things would happen. Sometimes you go pike fishing in Ontario with your dad in 1965, and sometimes you'd catch a bunch of five-pound pike that you'd take back to the cabin and yeah. fry up. And sometimes, holy crap, sometimes you'd catch a 35-pound pike one day because something special happened. And those experiences we've tried to, I think, truncate down to how quickly can I get to that mega experience and that's where so your brother shot a 330 inch even the way we're talking about it mm -hmm. right now is kind of disrespectful because you guys whether you realize it or not me whether i realize it or not we're justifying your brother's 330 inch bull we're yeah. saying there were giant bulls there but he had a good experience shooting a 330 we shouldn't even have to say that mm -hmm. we shouldn't we should not culturally exactly i agree 100 percent. we should not have to to feel like you know this is an experience that I just had with Brian. Brian and I went to Montana, right? And uh, you remember this. We were, we're hiking up on this ridge, and we hear these elk bugling. And what, they, what they're doing in this area is there's this uh, alfalfa field that's down at oh, the sure. base. Sure. And then they're coming up into their bedding areas up into this mountain range. Eating and, in the morning or overnight yeah, and then coming back. And then back. coming back. And so we're like, let's, let's intercept them. So it's me and Brian and this guy named Tanner. And we're, we're pursuing these animals or these elk, excuse me. And, and uh, we find these three bulls that are, are making their way up. And we, we, we've heard them. And so now it's like, which ridge do we pick? And so we, we make a call. It's and cat and mouse thing. Yeah, cat and like, mouse. I love it. We make the right call. We get in the right position. Sure enough. I can see one of the bulls in the very back. There's three of them in the very back mm -hmm. is a very big six an, by six. A big six by six. And there's two in front. And as Brian and I get into position, the very first bull comes through and he's at 75 yards. And this last year was my first elk as well. Okay. With, With a bow. bow. And so I, uh, and I always told myself, what did I tell you in camp? Opportunity. Mm -hmm. I will take my first opportunity. I will not question it. If it's a mature bull and it's good, I'll see nothing other than that that's what it is, and I want that moment. I want that opportunity. And sure enough, this guy came in. All of a sudden, in my mind, Donnie, I start saying to myself, you know, there's that guy. It's two bulls back. Do I wait? And does this, this mm -hmm. guy's coming in 75 yards on a string right to us. We're not even calling doing anything. He's just feeding right into us, and he gets at 45 yards, and I have the thought, do I pass this guy up? to wait for that big six by six. And I am not saying that I'm not trying to demean people that make that decision. But for me in that moment, I said, I knew what I was about. I knew what I wanted. I wanted that meat so bad. My wife and I were getting low in the freezer and I wanted that experience. I was there with one of my best friends and I'm, I'll never regret pulling that trigger. Sure. And letting that arrow fly sure. and having one of the most incredible and, and humbling experiences that I've been a part of. But uh, I've never, people have asked me, how big was he? And I was like, I don't know. I am, but it was an incredible hunt perfectly acceptable to to shoot something a shoot to pursue an animal and shoot an animal it's personal it's that you want to shoot that that's exactly right because i've done i've done the opposite and, and i do it every year like i've i've i live in wisconsin i've arrowed one buck in wisconsin i've passed hundreds and usually for me because when i'm home I see a big buck. I find a big buck, an old buck, and I start calling my buddies that have never killed a big buck. And I yeah. say, because white tails are a little bit more predictable than elk. And so I say, hey, you got to get out of here. Like, this deer's on his feet. Yeah. So I've done the same thing. I've waited for that third bull. And I will continue to do that in when it's appropriate and in my mind's eye. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're exactly right. It's what, it's what you, I think what, it is. What fulfills your vision. What fulfills your vision. I think it vision. is personal. But at the same time, I heard um, 
to speaking to your point, Shane Mahoney told, told me, um, I, I listened to one of his podcasts, his podcast, Conservation Matters, and he talked about back in the day, you know, before I say maybe the, the 90s, 80s, 90s time frame, that there was an emphasis in, um, in, in outdoor writing, you know, um, publishing magazines and such where, and, and books where the emphasis was on the animal, what, what, how, you know, the story was about the animal and it was about the experience and the environment, but it wasn't about the hunter. Yeah. I'm so awesome. I did this. I, I've trained all year. I can shoot. I, I drilled it. You know, yep. it was like, this is, um, you know, the equipment that I'm using. This and is what it's like to be there. To be there, to, to, to smell it, to see it. This other kind of story that's told, this other narrative. And it sort of shifted to a kill shot culture where it's just, did you, you know, I'm so awesome. And did you see me drop that thing? <laughs> and, yeah. and, and I think that we still that's have, so awesome. it's, it's still, it's still kind of that way. And as I, Oh, it's, it's more than just kind of that way. It's very it's, much, it's, it's it's that way, period, it's end the of story. Way. It's the way. When I watch your... We're lost. When I watch your footage and, and your films, you know, and I've been watching some other ones over the last few years, like, I've, I've found that... Um, I, I am encouraged, though, by other stories being As told. As Because... And I feel like there's this huge divide, actually, between... You know, I went to Texas with some friends, and we hunted whitetails. And this is the first year I've hunted whitetails, in 2017. Okay. Hunted them in Alabama. I did Oklahoma and I did Texas. Oh, okay. And uh, all of them unique in their own way. Oh, yeah. Alabama was February rut, so that was weird. But yeah. It was, and, it, and, and it's Alabama. Yeah, and, and it's, it's Alabama. Alabama. So it was kind of cool. It was, <laughs> it was Greenbow. Fun people, fun. Was, yeah, oh, yeah. Greenbow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I did the whitetail, and what I, I, we were down in Texas, and TV comes on. I, I don't have TV. I haven't had TV in 20 years, you know. Me either. TV comes on, and it's, hunting TV show and then hunting TV show. And, and I'm like, I, I cannot relate to this in any way. But like, you also can't look away. It's kind of like, a, it, you're, yeah, it's like a tractor beam. You're just like drawn, <laughs> but I'm to looking it. at it going, who is watching this? And like, somebody it is, does not resonate at all. Like I'm really disappointed in the whole message, the whole, this is what it is. And I think from um, a non-hunting perspective, someone who didn't grow up with hunting TV culture and so on, they're looking at it and they're going, I, I hate hunting. Mm -hmm. I don't like hunting mm -hmm. because the message and, and the and context the, around that experience is, is, it's, it's, is shallow. And so then, the, right? then you have like some of uh, this other content and don't get me wrong. I fall into this tra trap at times, you know, where I sort of, um, present a message that that is because I, I feel like i've grown up in both worlds you know this digital place I've, I've 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 been a fan of your work you know i watch the i like game of inches you know with mm -hmm. um rock house rock Boys. house yeah and i and i and i like um i like just i watch a lot of meat eater you know and it's this mm -hmm. focus on the meat and stuff i like mm -hmm. ranilla i like i like the podcast and so i like that you know whole culture and and i feel like that messaging is more in tune with what hunting really should be I think and what so. our messaging should be. I think be. so. I think those guys represent things very, very well. And, and, uh, and I think more than anything, they haven't picked a, uh, they haven't picked a, you know, even though Steve, and I don't know Steve, um, at all beyond, I've read some of his books and, and saw his show, but, um, you know, he's not, he's not, and I, I may speak out of turn cause I'm not him, but this is my impression that he's not branding meat eater. He's not sitting down at a table and going, how can I sell me or how can I sell this? What I think is, does he go by Steve or Steven? Yeah, Steve? Like Steve, Steve Ranella. But he's yeah, so, so I think Steve is being himself mm -hmm. and just going about this business as he would, whether someone's watching or not. And that's what makes it intriguing to watch. You're not watching a spectacle. He's just merely going through his life. He enjoys the protein aspect of what he's doing and, and, um, and the tastiness. Yeah, yeah. And we have some similarities, him and I, like, mm -hmm. I love eating these things, but we also have some dissimilarities. Like he, I've noticed, um, 
um, he'll shoot, you know, he'll go deer hunting and he'll shoot a year and a half old buck, which is absolutely fantastic. I have no problems with it at all. I'm probably not going to do it just because I have this mind's eye of like, I just enjoy engaging some older animals, but I completely respect it completely. There's, it's the same. It's the right. exact same. It's just everyone has their different. Like you guys were talking about, it's personal. You know, what, it's, don't, what, what adds up for you? Like, yeah, what, do yeah. you want, what do you want to do? But like, I when think, I go duck hunting, I shoot only drakes. But I think what's universal, though, is kind of, you're almost talking about motivation. Like, why you do what you do. So if a guy is, like I say this, we said this last night, I was talking to Jordan, I'm like, Okay, um, uh, you know, people s- writing in or, or following uh, stories on Instagram and so forth, that's a byproduct of trying to um, talk about the things I love and showcase what I love about them and have a positive message around hunting and trying to change the perception. Trying to, I say this all the time, I feel like hunters, if we all focused on making content that for the non hunter, basically a case for hunting it so to speak uh but if our content was was focused on the non-hunter um in everything we did the whole industry would be a lot better the whole world would be better i'll take even one step further if we hunted in a manner even not hunted in a manner that was consistent with an ecosystem a habitat a population um, if we did everything, whether it's generating content yeah. or whether it's a guy you will literally never hear about because he hunts his little farm in Kansas or he, he flies in Alaska every year and does his hunt. You have no idea who he is. He takes zero photos. He fills his yes. freezer, maybe hangs his, his antlers on his cabin wall or whatever. Uh, if we always hunt with regards to conservation, if we always hunt to, to leave the place better than when we found it, if we are making conscious decisions before we even engage in a population and say, okay, I really want to hunt this island of caribou, but I have noticed that um, with with climate change or, or with just over predation or, or lack of habitat, this population has really started to fall. If we're and say, okay, so okay, maybe I'm not going to hunt that this year, but if we do everything to perpetuate better, whether the camera's on or yeah. off, the other arguments really start to hold Fall very little water. Yeah. Very little water. Well, and if we're always trying, and, and I said this just recently, I just had a, a, a conversation mm-hmm. with a gentleman, but hunters should be, this is going to perpetuate where there's no hunting we are going to perpetuate into a world where there's no hunting we're we're just headed that way it's just how it works we're human beings we're consuming our earth faster than any other species ever has we're going to completely consume our 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 globe until it's it's destroyed or we get destroyed one of the two have to give up we are quickly reaching carrying capacity of the you know we're at eight billion people Uh, we'll be at nine billion in no time ten billion and pretty soon something has to stop Mm -hmm. and and Let's fast forward to that point. It's sad and horrible to think about, but hunters should be the very first ones to stop hunting. But I feel like we'll be the first ones to stand up right now and say, this is our quote-unquote right. I want to hunt. If you don't like it, get out of my face. Mm -hmm. But in reality, if you're really hunting, if you're really trying to be better for your ecosystem, your habitat, for the animal, for your family... You should be the first one to say, you know what? I don't know if it's viable anymore to hunt. I think we should probably put our bows and our guns and and items down and maybe pick up a shovel or a chainsaw or try to figure out human population. Or you know, these are yeah. huge, huge, huge you'll, you, questions. You'll but, hear Stephen Ranella make that comment. You know, he's like, if someone came to me and said, um, "Look, Ranella, uh, elk will be here forever, and they'll be here generation just after generation." But you can never hunt them again. That's the trade-off. Deal. He's like, I'd make that deal all, every time. Deal. I'll sign it today. And that's a real litmus test, I think, to ask yourself: Would you be? Would you sign that? Would you be okay with giving up hunting of a of a species for the rest of your life, as long as you knew they were guaranteed to? to yeah, to, the preservation to, of deal. The, preserve so did, they did not go extinct. Deal. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's that's that's easy. That's super easy. But that's not easy for like a you just said. Yeah a big part of, of yeah. the population. Yeah. Um, and those, that's, that's just, and that's try And it's a, it's a struggle. This isn't a slam dunk. Like mm-hmm. I, I struggle with this too. Sometimes like it's, it seems like we cut corners all the time and I feel the same way with myself, whether I use some sort of like, like 
I want to teach myself or be taught rather be taught. I want to, I've never shot trad. I've never shot yeah. recurves or beyond like being a kid. Mm-hmm. I want to learn that discipline because I think if I could get talented enough to hunt with it, um, I'd be curious if that's the road that I would go the rest of my life. And I don't know that I would or not, but I would just really appreciate that simplicity and getting back to the woodsmanship, mm-hmm. the bushcraft and, and, um, cause I, I enjoy that stuff and, and uh, I mean, the technology that these companies, you know, these Hoyt bows right here, mm-hmm. on my me. The minds that had to put these things I together. Know. I know. It's mind-blowing. But I wanna, it is. I want to say this, Donnie. I'm a little more optimistic than you about... about You're wrong. The environment, <laughs> climate, <laughs> global warming, the future. Um, humanity sucks, but it's also amazing. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, and, I, and I, I, and I'm, I, I'm, 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 I'm reducing down an unbelievably complex conversation to a single you're right. variable you're for right. ease of conversation. Yeah, I agree. But you're right. You're right in the sense that we're either going to screw it all up, nuke each other and be done, or we're going to sort it out. Because um, it kind of it's kind of going, um, let, let there's only you, so much resource on the planet. Would, would another bubonic plague sort it out? Is that sorting it out? I think so. Right, like I, I honestly oh, yeah. think that yeah. uh, we're, we're we're biological we're, we're animals. Are. Like for real, like there's there can be things that happen to the human race just due to well, do we mess around with like genetic stuff in laboratories all the time? <laughs> the stuff's not that far from reality. It, it, no, something I, gets out and spreads and kills the human population. I, I that's wish, not a surprise. I wish I could speak to this uh, intelligently, and I, I I don't have it enough to re- to. Uh, source mm-hmm. what I read, but I just recently read something where somebody had calculated out the spread of disease. Yes. Okay. And they'd calculate out if they gave one individual an uncurable disease, there's no anecdote. Everyone is susceptible aside from there's some, probably some natural genetic drift, some natural right. mutation mm-hmm. where some people cannot get this ailment. Yeah. But if you gave it to one person and basically hit the go button, the world's population which is somewhere around 7 billion right now, would be reduced to something like 2,000 people within like 14 days. That's, a sh- that's insane. That's a reset I, button. I think that there's a... Boom, done. But I think, uh, I think that you're getting deep. I think that global... Uh, but I Donnie's think going deep. Global extinction of, of the human race or like something near to it, it's completely plausible. What's interesting in this, and I remember this with you, Donnie, was the, that film that you put out, um, who we are. Yes. I'll never forget when I watched it and where I was, I was at work and uh, I had uh, Casey was with me and, and this is when we owned our, our marketing company and we were doing marketing for brands. And I remember seeing that, that mm-hmm. movie and I was, like, oh my gosh, guys, like this is like, we, we were working with companies, you know, some kill it and grill it companies and people that wanted us to help them in producing their content and doing these things. And I'll never forget when I watched that and how it touched me and how I was like, that, that is who we are. And that is who, that's who I am. Um, and I didn't think about anything other than just how well you were able to illustrate in that piece to, to who we are and who we all know who we should be, but to everyone who doesn't know who yeah. we are and i believe that if we we were to tell our story that way more to be more speaking to a non-hunter rather than two hunters it would change here's here's it a, would help humanity yeah. but it would change things significantly Here, here's my thing donnie like when you, when you're talking about this you know it could go one of two ways right i sit here and i think i first of all, and I've heard some other people say this, the world needs the next Donnie Vincent film. Like somebody has said that. Yeah. It's been said. It's been said. Yeah. Amongst all the hate mill you're getting and people waiting for it. They're like, the (laughs) world needs another. We're not going to open up any more pipe bombs. The world (laughs) needs another Donnie Vincent film. And the truth is it, it does. And, and that's why I think, you know, what I don't, what I don't want is to, is a uh, is for people to adopt a um, a a fatalistic opinion of the future or or a deterministic future vision where it's like well we can do, go through all these motions and we can try to make a difference but it probably won't change anything anyway mm-hmm. I hate that mm-hmm. like it's something I'm like I just refuse to to believe in that kind of thing and maybe I'm uh, like 
uh, naively optimistic, but I just I want to believe that that we add that I can and other people absolutely can make a difference. And I know for a fact that the films that you produced made a difference to me and have impacted a lot of people and have changed how they view hunting and they view the world. And so, especially non hunters and like when I showed it to women and my wife and others that are like, Oh, I understand hunting now. I I didn't get it before. Now I get it. Why, Why didn't, why didn't I get it before? Because it was like, you know, a, a kill shot reel. Mm-hmm. So I just, I just think that no, and I, and and, and I, there's no, there's certainly no doomsday. Like I, I do think things are perpetuating. I do think things. It's, it's funny because it seems like as as the water gets more muddy, it also is clearing up. Right, the the cream rises to the top. People are finding their way. Um, the negative and the dreadful uh, will. X themselves out, Mm -hmm. right? And there's always going to be this parabola of, there's always going to be this bell curve of information. There's going to be lead groups that are doing really fantastic things, inspiring people, trying to change, picking up a shovel or a chainsaw, building building homes for people. Yeah, yeah. just trying to, like being selfless in in all respects, both with wildlife, with habitat, with people, with human interests. And then there's this general population that's paying attention to what that bell curve says, right? They're, they're kind of saying, yeah, I see what these influencers are doing and they're inspiring me to make a better decision, you know, whether it be to eat better or whether it be to support farmers or, or ranchers in my area that are doing it better and, and building a better resource or people building better products are talking about even engaging and using their own time and their equipment to have a conversation so people have an opportunity to listen to ideas. And then there's um, the curmudgeons, right? There's the people that want to suck the soul out of the earth. You know, there's the, the you know, there's people that just want to like prey on others, right? Whether mm-hmm. that be uh, the guy that's going to carjack somebody at the corner of the street, or whether that's somebody from um, that's going to hit the, the nuclear yes. button in North Korea, right? So yes. w- whatever that be. So we have to live in all these parameters, and and um, and sometimes when I talk about the biological stuff, I hate even talking about it because there's a little piece of me that wishes that I was born. You know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, then you also realize that, well, I'd probably already be dead by now then. But, um, but you know, right. you like, you want to trans, but we are, we're here. We're yeah. here. This is where we are. And my ultimate thing, and, and this isn't my last point, this isn't my final thought, but I, the reason I do this, the reason I love filming and taking these photos and hunting and telling these stories, because selfishly, I want, this is how I want to experience my ride in my life. I want to hunt. I want to fish. I want to help people. I want to take people. I want to inspire people. I want to tell fun stories, cool stories. I want to give people, help people have a voice to know what to say or to just realize maybe their own thoughts. Right? Yeah. It's very difficult to articulate what we do. It's difficult to love something, also kill it, cut it up and eat it. Yeah. And there's a lot of really complex ideas there and so it's very difficult to articulate that certainly to somebody that has questions that you don't really know the answer to and and so as 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 we kind of go through anything that's selfishly that's my ride through this world not selfishly i didn't even know this existed but i love the fact that people are inspired by the work i love the fact that um like there's people in this building, we all know this, there's people in this building with way, 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 way fatter bank accounts than I have. I've, it just, I have, this just is not, I'm not doing this to get rich by any means. I, I, I just love the fact, I did not know it was going to happen, but I just love the fact that people are engaged with the work. That they yeah. say, oh man, finally I showed my wife and she gets it. I played uh, The Rivers Divide one time in a, an art film festival. I had nothing to do with hunting. Mm-hmm. I was terrified to do it. I won best best film, by the way, which was which was awesome. But this woman behind me, the film ended, and she was just like she sat up and she recognized that I was the guy from the film as I was slinking lower and lower <laughs> in my chair. And she was like, uh, and she just said, "Oh my god, oh my god, wow, wow, wow." She just kept saying that. Yeah. And I said, "What?" She's like, "My husband's been getting out of bed at three a.m. for twenty five years." And I had no freaking idea as to why. <laughs> and I now. Yes. And it, that wasn't who we are. That I was now the, That was the river's bite. So she was like, oh. Yeah. I, that's what I mean. He's chasing whatever this is, right? Uh-huh. Whatever. And so so I, I do, um, 
I'm not very good at putting myself on a pedestal and I'll, I'll never think of myself in that regard, but I do enjoy the fact that I have somehow found to work with a team of gentlemen that we are able to elevate all of us into having some storytelling and, and, and right. having some influence in the brand. And the way that you phrase things, the way that Ranella has framed things, um, I've heard, uh, you know, different, different influencers, you know, people I, uh, respect or admire hearing them uh, talk about hunting that I, w- I was able to kind of gl- figure out how, how to say what I wanted to say mm-hmm. too, which I'd struggle with the right words before. And I think it does a, I, I get emails a lot. I got some messages the other day that said, thank you for putting into words what I feel, but haven't expressed mm-hmm. well, like mm-hmm. I've done this a bad, and I just shared this with my wife. Mm-hmm. Thank you. You know? Mm-hmm. So I think, I think, um, but the one thing I, I definitely want to want to believe that um, we pe- we make a difference. That you can make a difference. Everyone does in some t- varying degrees. You know, mm-hmm. you mentioned earlier. You know, back. It's not just about the outcome. Like um, you're you're talking about selfishly. This is your ride. This is how you want to mm-hmm. experience it. And a byproduct really is that people love it. Mm-hmm. And that it changes people in a positive way. Mm-hmm. But the goal isn't necessarily always, you know, like, like for me, the goal isn't for Gritty Bowman to, to grow. The goal is to uh, change people's ideas, you know, to influence mm-hmm. people's mm-hmm. actions. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the byproduct is, is uh, growth, you know. So I think, I think it's, um, you're sur- we're surrounded in an area, in a place where, where all sorts of motives drive people. But I think, um, back to what you were saying earlier, if we can focus on the environment and the mm-hmm. natural world mm-hmm. and, and um, making a difference there, everything else will kind of fall into place. Yeah. Yeah. And anytime you're perpetuating positivity and doing things to try to, it's just, it's going to have a good yeah. byproduct. Is there like a, um, <laughs> when, when can we get another uh, little bit of content? <laughs> That's here. what I was going to say. Is like, so we have two, we have, I'm probably going to, and I know it's been a long time, but we're probably going to come out with two films this year. Two really? films this year? Two films this year. Wow. Yeah. And so uh, one uh, mm-hmm. is the one that they're working on right now. And I'll warn you right now, it's it's uh, it's wicked. Yeah. It's wicked. <laughs> yeah. It's it's wicked. And it's it's going to be exciting, and it's going to be adventure, and it's going to be uncomfortable. There are some uncomfortable parts of the film. There are some things that just do not go well. Mm. It's hard to watch. Um, begs, uh, raise some questions, yeah. some ideas, and things like that. But it's the reality of engaging uh, wilderness, wildlife, and putting yourself out there and, and going forward. Yes. And so... Um, it's probably we're probably going to come out with this film in like February. Cool, something like that. Um, right now, it's like an hour and a half long. I'm good with that. It's full cinematic. I I'm all down for it, that. I man. don't. It, it will will start to cut. Basically, we we, we build it um, with greed. Right now, yes. want this, want this, want this, want to say this, want this, love that. Great yeah. shot of a penguin. Yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> Great shot All of a penguin. Nat Geo. We, we, we get greedy. We get greedy. Right. And then I at know. the end, we sit down and we go, okay. Uh, all right. Truncate, 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 truncate yeah. down. Because we want to sensationalize the audience. We just want to entertain people. You want people Cherry to Cherry pick the best of the best. Yeah. You kind of want people to stop breathing in the theater, right? You yeah. just want them just like. Uh, and, and so that one will probably come out in like February. Um and then uh, the film that I've just been filming for the last four years in North Dakota, um, call it the Rivers Divide 2, really? if you will, um, <laughs> is, is wrapped up. And so we will put that piece together too, which is just, that's a fun piece because it's filmed beautifully in a beautiful place. Yeah. It's a classic deer Story. hunting scenario. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's the same deer hunt that everyone has done. And you can equate it to elk or moose or bears, mm-hmm. whatever it is that you grew up doing. It's it's just a classic. Like, it took me four years. Um, it's, 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 a sen- it's the same story as yeah. The Rivers Divide. It's just in a more sensational fashion because it took me, it took me longer. There was yeah. an older deer. Um, we just became better at our craft anyway yeah. of filming. We're using way better cameras. 
the, the gentleman that worked for me, uh, I shouldn't say that the gentleman that we work with at Sick Manta, who's our musician, is, I mean, he's, he was wickedly talented when we hired him. He's wickedly talented times one billion. Yeah. He's just like. He gets better with time. Oh, my word. The music that this kid cranks out will melt your face off. It is so haunting, and he's so talented. And we, we have this little studio, and he has his cello and his bass and his violin and his yeah. piano and his drums, and, and we record everything ourselves and do everything. It's just so the music, um, the writing, right? Like as I, as I ask myself these bigger questions, because I don't you – know, like if you think that I sit at home and say, yeah, ask me a question, I know the answer. Uh, that's not true. Most of my answers have come from people going, yeah, so Donnie, why do you hunt? And I'm like, oh, yeah. Uh. <laughs> well, and it, I, that yeah, it for the means to be a for really the good question. <laughs> yeah. And so, and that's what, that, that's one of the negative byproducts of what we do is that right. sometimes we give guys a voice, people a voice. And they and they reduce things down for ease. They reduce yep. things One down as we've done today. We they reduce things down to a single variable. So they say I'm a meat hunter, and that's just as misleading as saying oh, I'm a trophy hunter. And that's just as I mean, yeah. grossly it's so misleading as complex. Like, yeah, I mean it's so complex, and there's so many different decisions that go on in the in a moment. It's such a big decision, it's such a huge barrier of entry to even engage in this thing. So, so the first film, I don't even really want to tell you the title, but. Mm-hmm. It's this premise of. Um, I'll t- can I tell you one more story? Yeah. So it's this premise. <laughs> it's this yeah. premise of um, my mitigation as a hunter, my migration as a hunter, my growth as a hunter. Because my first big game hunt was in 1996. I haven't been doing this that long. So my first big game hunt was in 1996. I was, I'll make it very very quick. But I went mm-hmm. to Alaska on a black bear hunt with a friend of mine, self guided. In the Prince William Sound, we're like the Exxon Valdez sink. Yeah, right. uh, it's absolutely pristine, beautiful area, even post oil spill. And and we went in this area, and I remember going on this hunt, and I was just like, where it was a rifle hunt. I was like, you know, me and this guy, we were talking. I'm like, I'm going there, and I'm gonna um, climbing mountains, and I'm gonna kill a bear, one shot, one kill. I'm gonna shoot a massive bear. We're gonna skin him, and I'm gonna have his skull. And I'm coming home, and every like all my family and family will be like, "You're a bear hunter. You went to Alaska. You you saw glaciers. You saw whales. And you killed a bear. You packed it out. There was and, like, penguins. Yeah, <laughs> we filmed a penguin. Um, and so like that was my mind's eye. That yeah. was that was yes. And I literally like I'll never forget this. And um, the captain of the boat, his name was Ron Johnson. Old, old fisherman guy, and he, he would fish in the summer, and then he'd use his boat as kind of a floating hunting uh-huh. lodge in the fall. Yeah. He wasn't a guide. He would just drive you around where you want to go, and, and you know, he might say, hey, I saw I saw bears over here. You want to go cruise over there and see if they're... Yeah. So I remember he was driving. He had his little, the wheel of the ship, and he's driving this thing, and I'm like, so, Ron, like, you see some big bears, you know? And he was like, he'd always go, well, you know, yeah, I mean, I've seen a couple of big bears, you know? And I was like... Okay, like, I'm like, have you ever been, uh, you ever been charged? Uh, no. I'm like, have you ever, uh, you ever been attacked? No. I'm like, you ever, you ever seen a sow with cubs? You ever seen a sow with cubs? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, many times. I'm like, you ever, sow never? He's like, no. They all just walk the other way. I was like, huh. It's like, you ever, like, you know, I'm trying to, like, so where's the danger come from? Like, where's, how do you, where's the, Where's the thrill? Where's here? the tough guy? Where's the tough part come? You know, and so, <laughs> and so I went to shore that one night. Like he zodiac and into shore, and he dropped me off, and and I walked up, and I sat in this little pile of rocks, and there's it was low tide, and there's um like three salmon streams coming out right there, and they're full of pink salmon. I mean, the bears everywhere. I sit down, and I remember even putting a shell in my gun. I was like, <laughs> like I was on a stakeout. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I, I sat there like I was a sniper and I sat there and I had my gun and, and I just was all melted into this thing. Like I was doing this, like this uh-huh. is for real. And all of a sudden I, I kind of hear something off to my right and I, I look and here comes a huge bear. It wasn't a huge bear. It's probably 250 pound bear. <laughs> it looked huge. Looked huge. Looked huge. Yeah. huge. He was comes huge. out, he's probably like 20 yards, 10 yards, yeah. 20 yards, very close to me. And he comes walking down and I just see kind of his black fur and I was like, oh yeah. Yeah, this is okay. So I just start, and as I start peeling my head around, I look at him, and this, it changed my life. And it actually is, 
the entire embodiment of my films, the photos, my message, my story, the questions I asked myself all stem from this moment. And this entire film that we're launching in February is basically a long version of the story I'm telling mm-hmm. you right now. I started looking at this bear and I could see his nostrils moving around and then he opened his mouth and he's tasting there and he's going, you know, and I could see his pupils. He's looking around and I see his little eyes and I saw his nose moving side to side and I could see he's just walking out. And I remember I looked down at his claws stepping on the wet rocks and I just saw his toes kind of articulating around the rocks and then I saw a little kelp bulb. And he went down to the kelp bulb, you know, and he sniffed it a little bit, you know, and I saw him. He's kind of looking around. Bears kind of have this thing, like, they kind of move their head around, but they don't really, they're taking everything, but they don't really look at anything. Right. right? They're just kind of like, they're always, they're always ready to run. Yeah. It's really funny. If you, if you spend any time with bears, totally. they're, like, always ready to retreat. Yeah. Because there's usually they a bigger really bear that's trying see. to eat them. <laughs> yeah. Very well. I mean, they, 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 see, they see about as good as us, as, as people say. Especially but we black don't bear. See, yeah, we don't see that good. You know? No. So, like, no. so like, he walked out. And I just I started watching his chest heave, and his fur was wet, and I, I could see his little tail, and I saw his big butt, and I just saw his ears, and he's walking and just watching and smell. And then I ended up, you know, he, he went up to a dead fish, and he kind of sniffed it and turned it over with his paw. Mm-hmm. And I sat there and I was like, holy crap. I I don't even, I don't want to shoot this thing. Like I was just sitting there like, mes- I could not watch enough. Mm-hmm. I couldn't like, I'd look at his tail and I was like, oh, his ears. His, oh, his buff brown nose. Look, yeah. Oh, look at how he's sniffing. And, you know, he pulled his lip up one time and he licked something. And I saw a canine. And I was like, oh, look at his tooth. And look at his claws on the rocks and just watch him move. And I just... Watched him move, and I watched him all night long. And, like, 12 bears came out that night. And I watched them all, and they all left. And Ron picked me up, and he's like, I didn't hear a shot. And I was like, he's like, and he's watching. You know, he's like, I see. I saw. He's like, there are a lot of bears. And he's like, it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm going to shoot one. And he said, oh, what do you mean? I said, I don't, I don't know if I want to shoot. Like, this, that thing was amazing. It was so cool to watch. I was like, can we go in tomorrow? I just want to go in tomorrow and sit in a different spot and just watch some other bears. Yeah. And so we went through this. And so every night he started talking to me and he's like, if you don't want to shoot one, he's one of the sweetest men I've ever met. He's like, you don't want to shoot one. That's fine. You don't have to shoot one. He's like, but I think you'd be disappointed if you go home without shooting one. I said, you think so? He's like, I think so. He's like, I think you're a hunter. So I, I, I can see it in your eyes and I think you're a hunter. And he's like, I actually think you're a very good hunter. And, 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 uh, and it kind of built me up a little bit. And I said, you think so? And he's like, yeah, I think he's like, let's, let's just watch over the next few days. Let's just. And so we go fly fishing during the day or, or we'd go and check out whatever. He'd have a pretty waterfall he wanted me to see or I'd we'd fish halibut or fly fish salmon or whatever. Then we go watch bears at night. And just the more I just, and, and, and it just overwhelmed me. Mm-hmm. It overwhelmed me. And, and I ended up shooting one on the last day, shot a nice bear. And, um. And it just, 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 just like that whole experience was like, yeah. okay. And then fast forward to the river's divide. And I've told you guys this story before. You probably don't recall, but when I, when we were doing the river's divide, which I never thought we could do, my whole team was like, let's put a film together. And I was like, we can't. They're like, no, 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 let's put a film together. And I was like, yeah, we can't. And, and, and they said, no, like, and I said, we, it's too expensive. Like, we can't do this. We don't have any sponsors. Nobody knows who we are. We just can't do this. And they're like, no, well. We're really good at filming. You're an awesome storyteller. Yeah. You're a really good hunter. And we can, we kind of know how to do this film. Let's do this. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, yeah, we can't. You know, and then finally they convinced me I could. And then when I wrote for The Rivers Divide, I handed the paper to Kyle Nicolay, my producer and editor. I remember and this. Yeah. I handed it to him and he's like, yeah, that sucks. <laughs> That's the best part, dude. I've never, ever, ever heard, heard you, you talk like this. Yeah. I've never heard you talk like this. I've never heard you talk tough like this. I've never heard these words come out of your mouth. I've never seen you posture like this. And I wrote it for this room. Mm -hmm. I wrote it for the people in this room. I wrote what I thought they wanted to hear, what I thought would make them buy our movie. I was trying to commercialize my experience. And Kyle's like, no, no, no. Go, Go back, write vulnerable. Tell the truth. Yeah. Be super vulnerable. Just 
lay it out there. Spell yeah. it. At least gut yourself. And I did, and I came back. And he's like, yeah, this is, this is vulnerable. And so then we put it out there, and we're like, we are going to get – literally, we're like, this was fun. This is going to be our only film. We're going to get shredded, crucified. <laughs> People, my house, somebody's probably going to burn my house down tomorrow. <laughs> like, they are going to hate the fact that I say that I'm actually truly saddened when I kill an animal. Yeah. Like, I, right. I, you, you probably have footage or photographs of me fist pumping someday because that's what I thought you had to do. And sometimes I did that around people because I was overwhelmingly excited. I still will jump around like a maniac sometimes. And I just, oh, my God. Um, but <laughs> Me too. Other times I'm sober. Yeah. And really, really it's like, heavy. It's heavy. So the first time I shot a, a blacktail I had, tr- I had followed the life of for three or four years. And I hunted solo in a tree for a long time. And I saw this. I kept trying to kill this deer, cure this deer. And I felt like I knew this deer. And then finally when it came out. I didn't want to shoot it. Mm-hmm. And I sat there and I sat there and I sat there and I'm like, do I shoot it? Do I not shoot it? And then, um, then I shot it. And, um, immediately I was like, I was excited. Uh, it's about myself. And I, but I, I didn't, then I talked to my brother. I'm like, Hey brother, I, I shot, I shot the deer. I shot him. I mean, and stuff. And he's like, Oh yeah. And all this stuff. And he's like, I'm like, yeah, and I shot him, and, and you know, he went over here. And, uh, and, and after about five minutes, my brother goes, so are you happy or <laughs> sad? Are you jump, like, are you, are you jump out of your tree? Is this is a good <laughs> yeah, thing or yeah. a bad thing? Because yeah. I'm not, I'm, I'm really confused right now. And I'm like, and it didn't, I didn't even know that, I, that he was reading me that, that I was being so both mm-hmm. emotions at the same time. Mm-hmm. And when he brought it to my attention, I was like, I'm both. Mm-hmm. It's really complicated. Mm-hmm. It is. It is. And so, yeah, so I, I, that, that, that moment just, I was like, whew. Did you shoot a bear? I did. Yeah, I shot one on the last day. And um, there's a whole other avenue of that story, but we'll leave that for another time. But, yeah, I shot a bear, and I kind of just, like, kicked off. And I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did shoot a bear because some negative things happened after I shot the bear. The bear died instantly, died in, mm-hmm. just absolutely just dropped to the ground flat. So I don't want people to think it suffered. But um, some... Um, just some avenue of the hunt that I thought, like I thought we were going to keep all the meat. Mm-hmm. I thought, you know, like I, 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 that was what hunting was in my mind. Right. You went and hunted and engaged in an environment. You did these things, that, did these things. You got the head, the antlers, the bear hide, but you also took the meat. Like I was extremely aware of the meat aspect because when I was growing up, the books that I read, they ate the meat. Yeah. And so then, rendered the bear fat. They made soap out of it. Yeah, they yeah. Kind of, all, like all it's like stuff. you kind of have that. And 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 the people that I were with, um, basically got rid of the bear behind my back, uh, kind of thing. They yeah. kind of like they, I, I that, that that's the wrong way to say it. But uh, I don't know what you mean. It's happened to us on a trip, and they're like, oh, you well, want nobody that? ever wants it. <laughs> oh yeah, that was that actually did happen on a trip. I mean, they the, the guys we were with were were surprised that. We were really concerned about retrieving the animal and getting the meat. They were like, you, I mean, but why? Was, this, this I, they didn't say to, that, but it just felt to, that way. This speaks to your, the whole, the, the things that are wrong, mm-hmm. right? Where, you know, an animal goes down and then you're with some guys that are like, um, yeah, that's cool. We'll get it in a couple of days when the ravens show us where it's at. It's mm-hmm. like, or we can go now, like right now. <laughs> Yeah. And it was very disheartening, and it was very uh, – I can't even – I remember when I was I came back to the spot, and Brian began to tell me a story, and I, I just my heart sank. I was like, are you, are, you're kidding me, right? But the one thing that was telling was they're like, nobody – Nobody cares. Ever like cares. That. Yeah, anybody we've had to come into camp, they're asking us about the biggest, you know, wanna, animal we can get. We're, we're like – We'll cover those horns for you. Don't worry about it. Yeah, like, that's what the remark was. Whoa, wait a minute. Like, I don't care about that. Like, yeah. I'm here for this whole package, and – and uh, so definitely, I mean, you start monetizing things and, and there's a business behind it. And I think it, you can be easy to get clouded. But but so with your bear, it didn't quite work out like you thought. Yeah. But you still came away from it. Well, I learned so much. A hunter. Yeah, I, I learned so much. And, and Ron was uh, incredibly, you know, he's... Influential. Yeah, big time. Yeah. Like he so, was able to just talk to me through it. And, so are we going to see these films on Netflix? 
No. Where, 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 how are you? How are you? How is the distribution process going to happen? I'll sell them on DonnieVincent.com. Okay. Yeah. Because I have to, and um, and then I want to do. I, I, w- I would love to do like 10 theaters across the country to cool. do yeah. film openings. Look, Very I cool. want to watch it in a theater. I, I, that's yeah. I was I just going to say, if, see if you said it was an hour and some change, yeah, then uh, I would love to watch it in a theater. In that's, fact, we're doing a, a movie premiere for a film that he's producing in, uh, in February. Mm-hmm. And we've rent, we've rent out a theater and we're going to sell the seats so that people can come and have and enjoy his mountain goat film that he's produced. But I, there's something about, you know, people say like, Oh, let's watch it on Netflix or let's stream it at home. And I'm like, or I'll buy it and get it and yeah. I'll watch it in my house. I'm like, I don't know. It's like a Donnie film, like gritty film. Oh, dude, I, I want, like, I, I, want I want to watch the... that in the theater. So when you're ready to do that and if there's anything that sure. you're talking, be a part of that stop. Sure. You know, I definitely want oh, to for sure. help for that sure. because that would be fun. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. I, I want to do more of that stuff. Like we're working on a big Australia film, and I'd love to. I'd love to launch it in like Sydney. That's cool. Mm-hmm. I'd love to rent out a theater in Sydney. And, and that would be so people from Australia can appreciate it. But yeah, so so that's that's. Man, I'm so excited. That will be the distribution, and someday maybe we'll be able to distribute it for free. And I know there's a fine line there of like if you give it away for free, way more people see it. But that does like all um, you know. I I just haven't figured out how to live my life that way yet. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. No. Totally. Well, I think um, um, there are. You've done a fine job, Thank you know, you. with with Rivers Divide and Terra Nova, and I those. work with some really talented guys. Yes, too. you do. Your yeah. your yes, crew, yeah. your team that you trust and respect are. Um, I was thinking about this when you were telling your story. You can't just have a guy who knows how to film. You have to have a guy who understands like concealment and and stealthy movement and oh, yeah. filming from there, and then that you can rely on to get. The stinking shot oh, on yeah. the film, and and they can't be afraid of bears or snakes or spiders mm-hmm. or small airplanes or be or cold, rapids or, or small or weenies airplanes. when it gets cold. Yeah. Or oh yeah, like, man, we 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 yeah oh, yeah we yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome, so, man. Yeah. Dude, thank you, thank you, Donnie. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, this was Let fun. Us know. Yep. Appreciate your yeah. time. You need to uh, make any announcements or whatever. Yeah, you, wanna, you know, always. It'll be out. wicked. We'll do some big stuff, and and who knows? Maybe somebody will step up, and I'll, I'll be able to put this thing out for free. But who knows? Yeah, we'll, we'll see what we'll see what shakes out. So, All right, cool. man. Take Thanks, care. Guys. Later. Despite our ever-changing, ever-indignant world with its growing ignorance of and indifference to the ways of the wild, I remain a predator, pitying those who revel in artificiality and synthetic success while regarding me and my kind as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood. I stalk a real world of dark wood and tall grass stirred by a restless wind blowing across sunlit water and beneath star-strewn sky. And on those occasions when I choose to kill, to claim some small part of nature's bounty for my own, I do so by choice, quickly, with the learned efficiency of a skilled hunter. Further, in my heart and mind, I know the truth and make no apologies for my actions or my place in time. Others around me may opt to eat only plants, nuts, and fruits. Still others may employ faceless strangers to procure their meats, their leather, their feathers, and all those niceties and necessities of life. Such is their right, of course, and I wish them well. All I ask in return is no one begrudge me, and all of us who may answer the primordial stirrings within our hunter's souls, my right to do some of these things myself. What you just heard is a quote from M.R. James. We truly live in a world that is largely ignorant and indifferent to the ways of the wild. And although some regard us as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood, we have the opportunity to change the way these people view the hunter and the hunt. We can share our experiences and nature's bounty with those who employ these faceless strangers. And by so doing, we make a difference, not just for ourselves, but for the wild animals and the wild places we care so deeply about. Never stop sharing your passion for hunting and the outdoors. Our wild animals and our wild places depend on it. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman. <laughs>